a ghost ship. Firefield is a little village lying near the Portsmouth Road, about halfway between London and the sea. Don't you just find it by accident now and then? Call it pretty old fashioned place. We who live in it call it home, but don't find anything very pretty about it. We should be sorry to leave anywhere else. Our minds are taking the shape of the inn, the church and the green, I suppose. Events we never feel comfortable out of Fairfield. Of course, the Cockneys, with their vast houses and noise ridden streets, can call us rustics if they choose. But for all that, Fairfield is a better place to live than in than London. Dutton says he goes to London, his mind is bruised the weight of the houses. He was Cockney born. He had to live there himself when he was a little chap, but he knows better now. You didn't only really laugh. Perhaps some of you come from London Way. But it seems to me that a witness like that is worth a, a galleon of arguments. Dull. Well, you might find it dull. I assure you, I listened to the, all the London yarns you spun tonight. There's absolutely nothing on the business that happened at Fairfield. Because of our way of thinking and minding our own business, if one of your Londoners was sent down on a green and Saturday night when the ghosts of the lads were died in the war, keep thrust with the lasses who'd lie in the churchyard, he couldn't keep being, help being curious and interfering. Then the ghosts would go somewhere where it was quieter. But he must let them come and go. Don't make any fuss in the consequence. Fairfield is the ghostiest place in all England. Where I've seen a headless man sitting on the edge of the wall. Well, it broke line like the children playing about it, about it with its feet as if it was their father. Take no word for it. Spirits now know when they are well off as much as human beings. Still, I must admit that the thing I'm going to tell you about was a queer, even for our part of the world, where three packs of ghost hounds hunt regularly during the season. A Blackstreet's great grandfather is busy all night shoeing the gentleman's horses. Now that's the thing that wouldn't happen in London, because these interfering ways. The Blackstreet he lies up aloft and sleeps as quiet as a lamb. When he had a bad head, he shut it down to them, not to make so much noise. In the morning he found an old guinea left at the anvil as an apology. He wears it on his watch train now. I never get oh, now I must get on my story. If I, if I start telling you about the queer happenings at Fairfield, I'll never stop. It all came of the great storm in the spring of ninety seven. Yeah that we had two great storms. This is the first one. I remember it very well. Because I found in the morning it lifted the thatch to my pigsty, the windows, windows, window, garden, as clean as a boy's nut kite. He looked over the hedge, window, widow, widow Tom Lone, Fultz widow, that was, with true pudding with her nostriviums, with the daisy grabber. After I watched her for a little, I went down to the crots and grapes to tell landlord, he is, she has said to me, landlord, he laughed, being a married man, ease with sex, come to that, he said, the tempest has blown, something in my field, a kind of a ship, I think it would be. I surprised at, the, at that, until he explained it was only a ghost ship, and would do no, no, do no hurt to the turnips. We argued that he had been blown up from the sea at Portsmouth, and when we talked of something else, there were two states down a pasturage, a big tree at Lumbery's wind meadow. It was a rare storm. I reckon the wind had blown our ghosts all over England, are coming back for the days after the frowned horses and foot sore as possible. They were so glad to get back to Fairfield, and some of them walked up the street crying like little children. Squire said his great Grandfather's great grandfather had looked so dead beat since the Battle of Naseby. He was an educated man. What with one thing or another, I should think, was a week before we got straight again. Then one afternoon I met the landlord on the green. He had a worried face. I wish I'd come and have a look at the ship of my field. 
He said it to me. It seems to me it's leaning real hard on the turnips. I can't bear thinking what the missus will say when you seize it. I walked down the lane with him. Sure enough, there was a ship in the middle of the field. But such a ship was no man as that seen on water for three hundred years, let alone in the middle of a turnip field. It all was all painted black and covered with carvings. There's a great bay window in the stern, for all the world like a square drawing room. There's a crowd of little black cannon on deck. And looking out of the portholes, she was anchored at each end on the hot the hard ground. Even I had seen wonders of the world and of pictures first cards, but never seen anything to equal that. She seems a very solid for a gold ship, I said, seeing the landlord was bothered. Well, I shouldn't say it's betwixt and between, he answered, puzzling it over, but he's going to spoil a matter of fifty turnips, and Mrs. she wants it removed. We went up to her and touched her side. It was hard as a real ship. How these folks in England would call that very curious, he said. I don't know much about ships, but I, but I should think that ghost ships weighed solid two hundred tons. It seemed to me that she had to stay, come to stay. I feel sorry for the landlord, who was a married man. All the horses in Fairfield would, would move her out of my turnips, he said, frowning at her. Just then we heard a noise on her deck. We looked up and saw a man come out her front cabin, looking down at us very peacefully. He was dressed in a black uniform, cut with a rusty gold lace. He had a great cutlass at his side, a brass sheath. Are you Captain Bob for you rabbits? he said. The gentleman's voice, put in for recruits, or he seemed to have brought a rather far up the harbour. Harbour? said the landlord. Oi, you're fifty miles from the sea. Captain Roberts didn't turn a hair. So much for that as is that, he said coolly. Well, it's no coincidence. Then was a bit as upset at this. Well, I don't want to be unlabelly, he said. Well, I wish you wouldn't bought your ship in my field. You see, my wife gets great store on those turnips. The captain took a pinch of snuff out of the gold box. He put it out of his pocket and dusted his fingers with a silk handkerchief, very genteel fashion. Well, I only here for a few months, he said. But if testimony is by your name, esteem, a passive, you agree, good lady, I should be content with the weeks, words he does of the great gold boat from the wreck of his coat and tossed it down the landlord. Then the bus is red as a strawberry. Oh, I'm not denying she's from the jury, he said, but she's too much oh, she's too much for her for a sack full of turnips. Indeed, it was a handsome brooch. The captain laughed, tough man, he said. It's full sale, or you deserve a good price. Say no more about it. And saying goodbye to us, good day to us, he turned on his heel and went into the cabin. Then they walked back up the lane, like a man with a weight off his feet in mind. Now tell me to blow me a little bit of luck. He said, the missus will very much be much pleased with that brooch. It better than back, Miss Giddy, any day. 97 was Jubilee year. The year of the second Jubilee year, I remember. We had great doings at the Fairfield, so we had we didn't much didn't have much time to bother about the good ship. Though everyone it wasn't way of meddling things that didn't concern us. Then I said so his tenant once or twice was hoeing his turnips. Past the time of day, Lena's lady wore her new brooch to church every Sunday. We didn't mix much with the ghosts as of any time, all except for an idiot lad was in the village, and he didn't know the difference between a man and a ghost. Poor innocent. On Jubilee Day, however, somebody told Captain Roberts why the church bells were ringing, and he hoisted a flag and fired off his cannons like a loyal Englishman. Tis true, the guns were shutted, and we not a round shot got off. Old in Farmer Johnson's barn, but nobody thought much of that, such a season of rejoicing. It wasn't until the celebrations were over, we noticed that anything was wrong in the fair field. Tis a soon we get a maybe first thing, told me first about it. Well, morning, the fox and grapes. You know my great uncle? He said to me. You mean Joshua, the quiet lad? I answered, knowing him well. Quiet, said the shoemaker indignantly. Quiet, you call him? Coming home at three o'clock in the morning, as drunk as a ministry, waking up with the whole house with his noise. Why can't it be 
Well, I can't be Joshua. I said I knew him, for he was the most respectable young ghost in the village. Joshua he is, said Shoemaker. Said Shoemaker. And one of these nights he'll find himself out on the street if he ain't careful. This talk kind of talk shot me. I even can tell you I didn't like to bear a man abusing his own family. I could hardly believe that a steady youngster like Joshua take a drink. But just then, in a book, came in butcher or in, in such a temper, he could hardly drink his beer. A young puppy, a young puppy, he kept on saying. For some time before the shoemaker and I found out, talking about his own sister, fellow Sarak. Drink, said the shoemaker, hopefully. We had all, we all company. Now misfortunes, the butcher nodded grimly. The young noodle, he said, emptying his tankard. Well, after that, I kept my ears open. It's the same story all over the village. There was hardly a young man among the, all the ghosts of Fairford who didn't roll home in the small hours of the morning, the worse for liquor. I used to wake up in the night, hear them stumble past my house, singing outrageous songs. Worse of that was that we couldn't keep the scandal to ourselves. Folk of Green Hill began to talk of sudden. Fairfield and taught their children to sing the song about us. Sudden Fairfield, sudden Fairfield, with no use for bread and butter. Rum for breakfast, rum for breakfast, rum for tea, and rum for supper. We are all easy going in our village, but we didn't like that. Of course, we found out where the young fellows went to get the drink. The landlord was terribly cut up that the tenant should have turned out so badly. But his wife wouldn't hear of her parting on the poach. The poach so she wouldn't give the captain notice to quit. But as time went on, things grew from bad to worse. And all the hours of the day, you could see that those wrong reprobates Sleeping it off the village green. Nearly every afternoon, a ghost wagon used to jolt down to the ship with a landing of rum. Although, through the elder ghost, seemed to indicate, indicate to give the captain's hospitality to go by, the youngsters were neither to hold, either to hold nor to bind. So one afternoon, while I was taking my nap, I heard a knock on the door. There, there was this parson, looking very serious, like a man with a job before him. He didn't altogether relish. We're going down to my captain, but I talked to the captain about his drunkenness in the village. I want you to come with me, he said straight out. I couldn't say I fancied my village much. Myself, I tried to paint the parson, as this, after all, there's only a lot of ghosts. It didn't matter very much. Then I'll leave. Are you responsible for the good contact, he said. And I'm going to do my duty and put a stop to this code. Can you disorder? Are you coming with me, John Simmons? Simmons? I went past them, being a persuasive kind of man. We went down the ship as we approached her. We could see the captain testing the air on the deck. We saw a parson, he took off his hat very politely. I can't, I can tell you, I was relieved to find that he had proper respect for the cloth. Parson nodded his salute, spoke out very excelly, sir. Now, sir, I shall be glad to have a word of you. Come aboard, sir. Come aboard, said the captain. I can tell by his voice. He knew that we were there. Why were we there? Pars and I climbed up an easy kind of ladder. The captain took us to the great cabin at the back of the ship, where the bay window was. It's the most wonderful place you ever saw in your life. Full of gold and silver plate, swords with jeweled scabbards curved. Oak chairs, great chests, they'd look as though they're busting with guineas. Even Parson was surprised. He didn't make his head very, head very hard when the captain took down some silver caps and poured us out a drink of rum. I didn't mind, I didn't mind saying. It changed my view of things entirely. There was nothing to be between about the rum. I felt that it was ridiculous to blame the ladies for drinking too much of the stuff like that. It seemed full of, fill my veins with honey and fire. Parson put the case squarely to the captain, but I didn't listen much to what he said. I was busy sipping at my drink, and looking for the window at the fishes swimming to and fro, the landlord's turned lips. Then, it, just then, it seemed the most natural thing in the world, and should be there, for always. Of course, I could see that it proved it was a ghost ship. And then, even then, I thought it was queer, whether when I saw a drained sailor float by the fin air with his hair 
a beard full of bubbles. It was the first time I'd seen anything quite like that at Fairfax Field. All the time was regarding the wonders of deep, dear parson was telling Captain Roberts how there was no peace or rest in the village owing to the curse of drunkenness. What a bad example of youngsters selling an older ghost. Captain listened very attentively, and only put the word now. But just then about the boys being boys and young men selling their wild oats. But when Parson had finished his speech, he filled our silver cups and said to Parson with a flash, We shall be glad, sorry, to hear called trouble. Anywhere where I've been made welcome, I will be glad to hear that I put to sea tomorrow night. And now you must drink of me prosperous voyage. So he all stood up and drank the toast for of honour, and the other one was like hot oil in my veins. I let the captain show us some of the curiosities he brought back from the foreign parts. He was greatly amazed. Through laughter, I couldn't clearly remember what they were. I found myself walking across the turnips of Parson. The Parson, I was telling him the glory of the deep they, that, that they seen for the window of the ship. He turned on me severely. If who are you, you, John Simmons, he said. I should go straight home to bed. It was a way of putting things that didn't occur to only man was Parson. The parson, I did as he told me. Well, the next day it came to a blow. It blew harder and harder. Till eight o'clock at night, I heard a noise. I looked out in the garden. I dare say you won't believe me. It seems a bit tall, even to me. But the wind lifted a thatch of my pig's eye to widow's garden a second time. I wonder, wouldn't w- wait to hear what the widow had to say about it. So I went across the green to the fox and grapes. The wind was so strong that it danced along the Along on tiptoe like a girl on a fair. I put, when I got to the inn, the landlord had to help me shut the door. It seemed as though a dozen goats were pushing against it to come in out of the storm. It's a powerful tempest, he said, drawing in the beer. Oh, yeah, there's a chimney down at Duke Green End. The funny thing all those sailors know about, about the weather, I answered. When the captain said he was going tonight, I well, was thinking he could take a cup full of wind to carry the ship. Let's see. And now he is, he is more than a cup full. Oh yes, said the landlord. It's tonight he goes to laugh. Mind you, though he wouldn't, he treated me as the I went. I'm not sure he's a, a last to the village. I don't hold a degree of reverence. We fetch a drink from London instead of helping local traders to get their living. But you, you haven't got any rum like he is, I said to draw him out. His neck grew red with, above his collar. Afraid had gone too far, for after a while he got his breath and had a good grunt. Gentlemen Simmons, he said, you come down here on windy night to talk a lot of fools talk. You wasted a journey, a journey. Well, of course, then I had to smooth him down, praising his rum, and heaven forgive me, swearing is better than the captain's. But like any of, the, of that rum, no living lips had tasted some, some say, mine and parson's, but somehow or another, I brought Landon round, and presently he must have he must have a glass of his best to prove his quality. But eat that if you can, he cried. He both raised the glasses to our mouths. I didn't stop halfway and look at each other in amazement in maze. The wind had been blowing howling outside like an outrageous dog. All of a sudden turned and made a little to the choir boys of a Christmas day eve. Surely that is not my Martha? which the landlord, Martha being his great-aunt, lived on a loft overhead. He went to the door, and the wind burst it open, so the handle was driven clean into the plaster of the wall. We didn't think about it at the time, for over our heads, sailing very comfortably for the windy stars, we shipped that past the summer in the landlord's field. A portholes in our bay window were blazing with lights. There were noise of singing and fiddling on the decks. He's gone, shouted the landlord. Above the storm, you take half the village of him. Or you can only nod and answer, not having the lungs, not having lungs like bellows of lover. Morning, we were able to measure the strength of the storm. Over and above, my pigsty was a damage enough. Wrought in the village to keep me busy, as busy. True is that, true is that the children had to break down no branches for the firing that autumn. Since the wind had strewn the wood, the more they could carry away. Many of our ghosts were scattered on our board. This time, very few came back. All the young men, having sailed with the captain, nodding the ghosts, 
Well, half wrecked with the lad was missing. You reckon that he's stowed away, perhaps shipped as a cover boy, not knowing any better. And with the laminations of the ghost girls, the grumbling of the families, who lost their ancestor, the village was upset for a while. The funny thing was, it was the folk who complained most of the coming coming on to the youngsters, who made the most noise. Now they were gone. Had any sympathy with the shoemaker or the butcher? Ran about saying how much they missed their lads. Made me grieve to hear poor bereaved girls calling their lovers by name on the village green. Nightfall didn't seem fair to me. They should have lost their men a second time, or given up life in order to join them. As like as not, still not even a spirit can be forever sorry forever. Another few months we made up our mind. A folk we sailed in the ship. We're never coming back. We didn't talk about it any more. Then one day, I dare say, it would be it would be a couple of years after when the whole business was quite forgotten. Who would come transparenting along the road from Portsmouth? The daft lad who'd gone away with the ship without waiting till he was dead to become a ghost. You never saw such, saw such a boy as that all your life. He's a great rusty cutlass, hanging to a string of his waist, he tattered all over his fine colours. Not even his face looked like a girl, looked like a girl sampler. His handkerchief is a hand full of foreign shells, old fashioned pieces of small money. Very curious, he walked up to the well, to the well outside his mother's house, and drew himself a drink. So he'd have been nowhere in particular. The worst was that he had come back as a soft headed as he went. I tried as you might, we couldn't get anything reasonable out of him. He talked a lot of gibberish about kill hilding and walking the plank and crimson murders. Things which a decent sailor should not know nothing about, as it seemed to me that all his manners captain had been made more of a part than a gentleman marrier. But the draw sense of the boy was as hard as picking cherries off a crab tree. One silly tale he had had and kept on drifting back to and hear him. You would have thought he was the only thing that happened to him in his life. We were that anchor, he said. An an island called a basket of flowers. And the sailors caught a lot of parrots. We are teaching them to swear. Up and down the decks, up and down the decks. The language they used was dreadful. We looked up and down, up and saw the master's Spanish ship. Outside the harbour, outside the harbour, they were so we threw the parrots in the sea and sailed out to fight. All the parents had drowned at the sea. A language he used was dreadful. This is the sort of boy he was. Nothing but silly talk. Or oh, parrots. You know, asked about the fighting. You never had a chance of teaching him better. For two days he went away, away again. For two days he went away again. And we haven't seen him, hasn't been seen since. That's my story to show you that things like that are happening on Fairfield all the time. The ship has gone, never come back. And somehow as people grow older, they seem to think, one of those windy nights, she will be come sailing in over the hedges, all the lost ghosts of gold. Well, then she comes, she'll be welcome. There's one ghost last that has never grown tired of waiting for a lad to return. Every night, you see her out on the screen, draining her poor eyes, but looking out, looking for the mast lights among the stars. But even as you call her, I'm thinking you'll be right. Ellen's field, there's a penny the worse for a visit. But they do say that since then the turnips have been grown in their tasted of rum.